Okay. Okay, so welcome again. Uh, we are still in chapter three, and this time we're going to be uh, working on the apply exercises. Uh, I just did the first three for this session uh, because I believe that they're the most uh, they are the most applicable to what you know we were doing. Uh, explain the theory, and uh, I'm st I haven't still posted this into the book club. Because I really have to, you know, make sure that everything is going to work, you know, out there. There's some modifications that I have to do. But anyway, so the, the first thing, this is a quarto document, right? You know, this is the HTML version, the rendering of the quarto document. And the first thing that we do, as we do in R, is, uh, you know, uh, load our packages or in Python import the libraries. So usually you're going to have a couple of libraries that are, you know, like the, the basics uh, for working with uh, with uh, data frames, which is pandas, numpy, matplotlib uh, for graphical, et cetera, even a uh, Seaborg, which is a wrapper of matplotlib. Then we're going to import this uh, library, which is called stats models, which kind of mimics what we're doing in R, but in Python. So, I'm importing the stats model API, which is the, mm, the major functions of stats model as SM. So when I want to use uh, a function from stats model, instead of calling the stats model API, I want to use SM as the, as the proxy. And also in Python, you have the, the advantage of, instead of importing all the, uh, all the contents of the library, you can import just what you need. So in this case, from stats model formula.api, which is where OLS, the ordinary uh, linear uh, least squares uh, regression uh, resides, I'm going to only import that one. So I can call it the function that we're going to use as LM in R, we're going to use the OLS. And, it's, and it mimics very well the formulas and the data and all the parameters that you, we will use in LM, we're going to use it with OLS. Okay, there's also other libraries. For example, I had to import this one uh, because it was giving me a lot of uh, warnings in terms of the fonts that I was using. So I had to, you know, uh, load that that library there so we don't have that that uh, you know those warnings. Then because I'm using Seaborn, I'm using through Matplotlib. I'm using this theme, which is a theme. Uh, the white grid is a theme. Uh, similar to the theme in black and white that we can use uh, when you use ggplot. I'm going to fill the warning so I don't want those warnings, uh, you know, bothering <laughs> our output. And then the figure and the size, which is going to be the default is going to be 10 by eight. Uh, some of them are going to be uh, uh, tailored with different sizes. And one of the things that I wanted to do is try to accommodate everything in this format, but uh, it requires a little bit more understanding of how Quarto, you know, configures the, the images. So that's something that I have to uh, to work on it. Okay, so let's go to our exercises. So the apply, the first exercise that we're going to be discussing is number eight, okay? And this one involves what is called the auto uh, data set. So one of the things that is good you know, to to begin is try to see what are the contents of that of that data set in terms of starting with the data dictionary to see what is the definition of each of the variables that we're going to be uh, working on. So here we have MPG, which is miles per gallon of each of the vehicles that are part of the data set. We have the number of cylinders from three to eight. We have the engine displacement okay, which is a measure of how big the engine is in cubic inches. We have the horsepower, which is the, you know, the, 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 the output of that, of that engine. We have the weight, okay, in pounds. We have the acceleration, and the acceleration is a measure of seconds on how fast that vehicle is going to attain zero to 60 miles, okay? So the, you know, the, the lower the number, the faster that vehicle can attain 
zero to 60 miles in a straight line. Uh, the year, which is going to be the model year, but here it says modulo 100. So instead of the year being 1970, you are going to only have the 70. In other words, the first two digits are going to be, uh, uh, are, are, you know, you're not, you're not going to see them. Okay. Then you will have the origin, and the vehicle origin is a label and is coded as one, two, three, and one is uh, models from American companies, two is from European companies, and three is from Japanese companies. Okay. So this is more like a qualitative. Uh, a predictor, and then the name of the vehicle with the manufacturer, the model, etc. So before we start, uh, you know, constructing our, our regression model, uh, the first thing that usually I do is try to do an exploration of that data set to familiarize with the variables, with the types, uh, what is the range, you know, especially when in numeric, what is the range? Do they fit a Gaussian distribution or not? And so on. So here, when we read our auto uh, data set, we can use the head function, right? To get the first five uh, rows of that uh, data set. And as you can see, you know, you had the, the, all the variables, you know, at the top with their proper names. And we see some of the quantities that we're going to be, you know, uh, we're going to be uh, working on, okay? And the name of the of, of each of the of the observation, which is a, a model of, of the vehicle. Then with info, auto info, what we do is try to see what are the types of each variables. Are, are they are in the type that they should be? For example, miles per gallon here is a float. In R, it will be like a double, but it's a float. In other words, it's not an integer. So miles per gallon, yeah, it should be a float because you could have 20.1 miles per gallon or 15.8. So you have some decimals involved there. The cylinders is an integer. And right now we're going to leave it that way because the cylinders is how many cylinders the engine has. So it's, it float, fluctuates from three to eight but it's an integer number. In other words, it doesn't have any, any decimals. Then we go to the displacement, horsepower, origin, gear, name, and the name is the one that is uh, for, by default because they are characters, right? In that name, uh, pandas is automatically giving the type of object, okay? In other words, it's like a, like a string, right? Or, or text, uh, not very... Uh, not very descriptive, right? That that object, but at least the other ones, you know, we can work on. The only one that probably we're going to be handling a little bit different is this one, the origin, because even though it says that it's an integer, the one to three, we know that that is a label. You know, you're not going to do any numerical uh, uh, operations with that with those with those labels. Okay, it could be the same as A B C or you know, A, E, and J as American, European, and, and Japanese. All right. So another thing that I want to check if, if I have any missing values, wh why is that? Well, uh, our linear regression model, it doesn't like uh, uh, missing values. In other words, all the observations have to have some meaningful, meaningful data there and no, uh, uh, no uh, spaces, uh, they're going to give us an error, okay? So if we have any missing values, we have to you know, kind of deal with them. Maybe maybe de de delete them if that's possible, or maybe do some kind of uh, imputation. But in our case, when we do this, auto is no, we sum each of the, of the, of the, you know, of the series of the, of the data set, and then we sum everything. So this gives you a value of zero. So that means that there are no null values, in other words. And in Python, a difference with R in Python, you're going to see an N-A-N usually as, as a null you know, character. In R, we know that it's N-A. So you know, for our, uh, our uh, peace of mind, uh, there's no missing values, okay? So that, that's good. 
that's good. Uh, Ricardo, I have a question. Uh -huh, yes. Question. Yes. So then with putting the dot sum twice, it's like yes. you used to do it for the columns and the rows individually. Is that what's happening? Uh, yeah, what, what, what I'm trying to see right, right off the bat, if is, there's any missing values there. So what I'm doing is, uh, OK, I'm going to take the data frame, right? Remember that in Python, the data frame is a, is a set of series. OK, that, that's how Pandas is, is viewing this. So each series is, you know, the columns, OK, this series. So the first is null. The sum is going to apply to a series. So if I do only one sum, it's going to give me each of the, each of the series, the MPG, the, the cylinder, the displacement. And then it's going to tell me how many. How many missing values do I have? OK, but since I just want to do a global check, let's put, let's put it this way, global check if there's any missing values, and then I'll go in detail if, if needed, right? So I'm, that's why I'm, I'm repeating the sum again. So I can get a, a, a quick look if there's any missing values on this data set. If there's none, zero, then I can keep going. And I don't have oh, to okay. go, go by, one by one. All right. Yeah. Thank okay. You. But if there was something else than zero, for example, if there was five, uh, then I have to see. Okay, where are those missing values associated? Are there in one one variable or multiple variables? And then I will use only one sum. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Yes. All right. So. The next uh, step that I do in my exploration is to uh, do some descriptive statistics. So this function describe, okay? And if you add a T here, it's going to trans transverse, you know, that, uh, that matrix, which is convenient because sometimes if you don't use the T, you're going to have these variables, you know, on top and then the statistics, you know, at the, at, at the left side. And sometimes when you have a lot of uh, variables, then it's, it's, it, it kind of gets you know uh, difficult to read. So that's why you know I use the T to try to uh, get this fix, okay, this uh, column fix, which is the statistics, and then all the variables that are going to be you know uh, uh, included in the data set. Okay, so here. This is just going to apply to the numeric. It doesn't apply to the to the object. There is a way to do it, okay? If you do parentheses, include all, it's going to also include the objects. But if you leave it as this, uh, it's going to only include the numeric uh, uh, variables, okay? So here we have the count, how many observations we have. We have the mean, right, the average. We have the standard deviation. And we have the five-point statistics, right? The minimum value, which is 0% uh, quantile, 25%, 50%, which is the median, 75% and the maximum value. Uh, one of the things that I always check right in here is to see you know, how, how is the mean and the 50% related with, okay? Because that gives me a sense of how skewed that distribution of that variable is. So in this case, in MPG, we have a median of 23, and a mean of 23.5. So not that bad, but still the mean is kind of 0.5 off the, 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 the median point. Okay, the, the median, which is the, the cutoff of the whole of the whole distribution, okay, instead of ranking. Then also we have, for example, horsepower. And horsepower now we see that the median is 93, but the mean is 104. So it's kind of you know skewed, right? skewed more to the to the left of, of ours. In other words, the, me, the, the median is going to group the middle point, but the mean is going to be a little bit offset. So that means that there's some skewness here in that horsepower. And it could mean also because of this max value, 230, compared to the mean and to the, uh, you know, to the, to the medium, that there could be some outliers, OK? But that's something that uh, little by little, you know, you get to, you know, to, to uh, to observe and visualize, you know, when you start uh, uh, using this function with different data sets, okay? Then, because the I is always, 
you know, catches more than a thousand words, right? A picture is, is worth more than a thousand words. There's another function very useful that is hist with parentheses, okay? And you can apply it to the data flow. And it's going to do the same here, apply it to the numeric variables, but instead of giving you the statistics in, you know, in that table, it's going to give you some histograms. And this one is also very interesting. As you can see, MPG has a skew to the right. Okay, so in other words, it doesn't behave like a Gaussian distribution. The same thing at host power and weight and displacement. Also, you see that cylinders, all the values are bucketed, right? Are bucketed in integers. And the most uh, counts that we have with the cylinders is four, six, and eight. Even though we have three and four, but three and five, sorry, three and five are the lesser ones, all right? And also, origin behaves exactly the same. You know, it's like a it's like a count, right? Of how many are from the American companies and European and Japanese, and we can see that the Americans are the most uh, frequent here. Okay. So, any comments on this before we get busy on the on the linear regression? Looks good. Looks good. Looks good, right? Okay. So mm -hmm. now we yeah, uh, good. Go ahead. Go ahead. And I was saying all good as well. Good, good. Okay. Yeah. So that, now we have a, a good idea of what we're what we're dealing with, right? Now, the first order of business for this exercise uh, uh, A is to use this function, right? Uh, SM capital OLS, which is another function within the SM. You will see that eventually I'm going to use more the, the, the lowercase OLS, and you'll see why. But let's you know keep with the exercise. Uh, let's use this function, SM, uh, that OLS, to perform a simple linear regression with MPG as our response, OK, as our dependent variable, and then horsepower as our predictor. And then use the summary function, right? The summary method for that, for to, you know, to get the results. So here, this is one, one way to do it, in many, many ways to do it. But this one, you can, uh, you can create a variable called y, which is the response, right, with auto.mpg. I'm make, making sure that it's float. We know that it's float, but just making sure that it's float. Then we're going to use also horsepower, and we're going to change the type to, to float also, OK? Because here, horsepower was an integer. And we don't want to miss anything, right? We don't want to truncate anything. So we're going to have two variables called y and the lowercase x, which is, the, which is a series of the horsepower. And then we're going to add a constant. That's part of the, of the stats model uh, framework. You need to add a constant if you want the intercept, OK? So that's going to be the big X here, OK? And it's going to be SM at constant with this series called X, all right? And then the model that we're going to fit is this, SM OLS with the lowercase y, uppercase X, which includes the lowercase values of core horsepower plus the constant, the intercept. And then we're going to fit it, OK? When we run this, we already have a model, a linear regression model. And what we want to do is apply the summary method to that model, model.summary, OK? And this is the result. And this is something that usually is similar to what we get in when using R with the LM method. Uh, we, get, we get some descriptions, you know, general descriptions for the model. This is a least squares. Is, it was run today, okay, September 10. The dependent variable is MPG. And then we get some of the metrics that we discussed in our previous session about how good the model is fitting the, the, the data that, that we have. And the R square here is 0.64. So that means here, that means that 60.4%, uh, okay, the model, is explaining at least 64% of the variability of the MPG. But remember that the R square, if we keep adding uh, predictors, 
is going to be equal or more. So sometimes we have to also watch the adjusted R square where we're, when we're adding uh, additional predictors. In this case, it's just simple. So, you know, more or less, you know, they're the same uh, value. Then we have our F statistics, and we're going to be, you know, uh, uh, doing some comments on that. And this is the this is the model that we're getting from the linear regression. So, for example, the constant, the intercept, is going to be forty point zero four, right? The estimate of that uh, coefficient, and then the horsepower is going to have an estimate of negative zero point fifteen eighty six. Okay. So, any questions so far? Can you go back up to the code? I'm sorry, sorry. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. The uh -huh. other code, when, when you added the constant, can you go back up? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, so basically, if you didn't have that, it would just do like, it would just have like, um, like a, um, like a coefficient for the X, but not like a say beta zero kind of thing. Well, here, what you're doing is activating the beta zero in the, in yeah. the, in the okay? So if we don't add this, then you are discarding the intercept. Mm. Okay. okay, so the body is going to be only beta one estimate mm. equal by X equal to Y. Mm. Okay? When, okay. when you add this, you are activating the beta zero estimate in the model. Okay, and then the sm.ols is that whole part is the ln, the kind of ln function, kind of. Thing. Uh, which one here? Oh, model is equal to. So yeah, so the sm.ols that's like the ln, and then right. um, adding the dot fit is like when you put Correct. the model into. I'm forgetting the name of that um thing, but okay, yeah, I see what's happening. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because you are. You, you are constructing the, the, the linear regression with these parameters, but then you have to fit it, okay? In other words, that fit function, what it does is that it, comp it, it does the calculations for the estimates of the coefficients, all right? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. And it puts it in here, in the, in the model, okay? Something similar that we do in our, for example, with LM, Okay, when we do LM, we can do the, you know, the X, the Y, and then the data, right? The data here, because we're using directly the, the, the series, you know, for each of the variables, uh, we don't need to spe specify the data. We just specify the series here. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. But that's, that's one way to do it. We're going to see there's another way to do it, which is more akin to what you have seen in R. Okay. Good. Are we good? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Lucia, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah. Uh, my my doubt was the same as Lydia, but okay. Uh, it's not clear. It's not clear. Thanks. Okay. Good. Excellent. So if you want, you know, in in stats model, if you want to activate a constant, you have to do this. Okay. Uh, different from R that you don't have to. I mean, there's a way to get rid of the intercept, right? Uh, within the formula for statement, but here you have to add another, an, an, another uh, you know, it's another method really with, within SM to add that constant, okay? So we talk a little bit about the R square, right? And that's in page, when I refresh it, that's in page 79 of the meaning of the R square, et cetera, which is the coefficient of determination, ta, ta, ta. And then also the F statistic, which is a, 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 hypoth a, you know, a hypothesis test where the null hypothesis is the model with the intercept only. So what we're trying to, the F statistic, what it's, it's telling you is that when you add something else besides the intercept or the constant, if the model is improving in that sense. And in this sense, because the F statistics the greater than anything but one, it will be an improvement. You can reject that, that no hypothesis. The statistics give you 
a value of six six hundred three point four, which is kind of you know this is similar to this uh, to this r square, right? Okay, the only thing that we have added, you know, we have moved the, the decimal point. And the probability, the p-value of that F statistic, in other words, the probability of that being zero is very small. Okay, it's in the uh, one of those decimals, you know, with uh, 81 zeros. Okay. <laughs> so the second question that we have is how strong is the relationship between the predictor and the response? Okay. So here we could say that at least you know with that r square of 60 percent you know 60 percent uh exponential variability uh it's not bad okay could it be better yeah, probably it, it, it could you know we could tweak a little bit you know to see you know if we can get an, a, 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 an increase in the r square to get more exponential the variability but we have another another uh, statistic which is the rse that we study also in the in the previous uh, session, which is the residual standard error, and the way to get this is with this method. Okay, with a model, you can call resid standard. Okay, and the degrees of freedom because we need the degrees of freedom here to calculate. You know the 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 the, the statistic is going to be the number of predictors. Okay, in this case, which is x, shape, and one. All right. Okay, remember the x here? This one. Okay, that it has included already the predictors here. So here, with that degrees of uh, freedom, uh, degrees of freedom, we have this statistic, 4.928. So what does that mean? What does that mean? That means that this is the residual error. In other words, from the MPG, from the mean of the MPG, which is 23.5158, and we can check it right here. 23.5158, that's the mean. Okay. That percentage error is approximately 4.928 divided by this number, by the mean. Okay, in terms of, you know, it's going to give you like a range of, of you know, how how deviate, how deviate can be that mean from the true value. And it's going to be approximately 21%. Okay, so we have a percentage error of 21%. Is it good? Is it bad? Well, it, it depends on what, you know, uh, your, your, your goal is. Maybe it's not that, that good. If you want to, you know, try to reach like a 10%, or a 15%, you know, uh, a percentage error, okay? And that's why, you know, you still have to keep working on the on the model. Okay, so the third one, is the relationship between the predictor and the response positive or negative, okay? So here, uh, we can do, okay, another function from the stats package, which is called lean regress, okay? And here, we're going to use only the X, and only the Y, and we're going to get all these values. And these values are going to be, you know, uh, you, know uh, 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 you know, stored in this uh, values object, right? In this value uh, variable there. So we can have here the slope, okay? Which is value index zero, we can have the constant, we can have the R value, the R square and the P value, okay? So here, what well, we're trying to see is the slope, okay? Which is equal to this number, the coefficient of estimate for the horsepower, which is the slope of the re linear regression. And the slope is negative, right? So that means, right? That the relationship with the predictor and the response is going to be negative, all right? So what does that mean? That means that when the horsepower increases, as the plot that I'm showing you is telling you, where the horsepower increases, the MPG is going to be decreasing. And that's, that makes sense, right? The more horsepower that my engine can produce is going to consume more, more energy, more gallons of, uh, of, uh, of, of gasoline. 
So the MPG demands per gallon is going to be reducing because I need more energy to travel the same distance. All right. Okay, so the answer is negative here. Okay, so the last question on this on this uh, uh, on this section: What is the predicted MPG associated with a horsepower of ninety-eight? And what are the associated ninety-five percent confidence and prediction intervals? Okay, so the model, the regression model, has a method called get prediction. Okay. But here, get prediction, we need something something to input that, that method. And the way that it, this works is that we're going to input an array, okay, and a NumPy array with one, okay, and 98. Uh, why the one? I'm not sure why, but I tried it with 98 only, I didn't work, <laughs> okay. So I had to put a one and I check it, you know, in other sources and they say, no, you need that, you need that one. Okay, to make it like a two-dimensional array. So this could be like an index. Okay, let's put it that way. So if I want to, you know, make more predictions, this is going to be 198 to the next value, etc. Okay, so now we have that array. We're going to insert it as a, as the input for this get prediction, and we're going to get our predictive value. So in the stats model, this is very convenient because if you try to code this, you're going to you know, be working a lot. So there's, uh, hope, uh, uh, you know, thankfully, there's this, this uh, 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 method called summary frame that it takes that prediction and with the alpha of 0 0.05, because we're trying to get the 95 uh, confidence intervals or alpha is going to be 0 0.05, you know, the complement, then we get this nice table, all right? So for 98 uh, uh, horsepower, the MPG, which is going to be the mean, uh, predicted, is going to be 24.49. Let's round it to 24.5. So with 98 horsepower, 24.5. Then we get the standard error of the mean, which is as associated with this, and then we get the confidence interval of the mean, which is the confidence interval per se. And then we get this or another confidence interval, which are the predictive intervals. As you can see, they are totally different, okay? One is regarding the mean, and the other one is regarding the value that we have predicted, okay? And to make a little bit more clear, what is the difference? I uh, inserted this link here, confidence and prediction intervals. What is the difference? So if we see here, he says that confidence intervals represent a range of values that are likely to contain the true mean value, the true mean value, okay, of some response variable based on specific values of one or more predictive values. So the confidence intervals refers to the mean value. In other words, the, the value of the mean that we are trying to predict, okay? In the prediction intervals, this represents a range of values that are likely to contain the true values on response for a single new observation. So depending on the observation, you're going to get then the predicted values, which are going to be larger than the confidence interval in the mean, okay? And you can follow this article. It's very nice. It gives you the formulas and everything. Okay, but yeah, but this could this could be something that you could uh, you could encounter in an in interview. For example, uh, someone could ask you, okay, you know, tell me if you do a linear regression, what is the difference between the confidence intervals and the prediction intervals? Okay, so it's something that you know we should we should have in the back of, of our mind. All right. Okay. Yes. Is why they're exactly. Yeah. Uh, usually the prediction interval is wider, okay? Because it's depending on that single observation. The confidence intervals, it refers always to the mean. And in fact, when you see this, this line here, which is the regression line, you see this shadowy, you know, uh, you know, the shadowy range here, you know, from the line, those are the confidence intervals, okay? Which are very tight here, all right? 
Okay. Questions so far? No comments. <laughs> good. You're good. Okay, let me see. We have okay, we have 20 minutes. So let's see how we how how how, how far we can advance. All right, so there was another question here in terms of, you know, if we could produce some di diagnostic plots for for the reg regression fit. And what we are, they are asking here is some residual a diagnostic plots. So the first one, which you can, you could construct, you know, easily with a Seaborn and the his plot method is the model residuals. Okay, this is the, this is the, the function and the method that is going to give you the residuals, which is the difference between the estimate, right? You know, the, the values contained in, in that line and then the true values, right? The, the, the errors, the residuals. So here, when we plot this, we see that, you know, it's fairly, right? It's fairly Gaussian, okay? It has that bell curve shape. But to make sure that our eyes don't deceive us, um, there is a method here in stats, Okay, in SciPy SciPy library called stats uh, that gives give us the the statistics for that model residual. And as you can see, if the residuals are really following the Gaussian distribution, the mean should be zero. Okay, and the standard deviation should be close to one. All right, that's going to be your standard, you know, uh, normal distribution, and the uh, residuals should follow that. Here we have a mean of minus 141 and a standard deviation of 4.9. So that's not really following, you know, the, the standardized, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gaussian distribution, normal distribution. So another method that we can do to do a normality test is called the Shapiro wheel uh, normality test, okay, which is one of the most common. There are many out there, but this is one of the common. So what we do is Use the stats again and do Shapiro. And it's going to call that, that test. And we're going to input the residuals. So here, the output of the Shapiro is this. We have a statistic of 0 0.98, but this is the one that you are looking, the p-value. And the p-value is very small, right? It's in the power of my minus pi. So that means that the null hypothesis here in the Shapiro is that the distribution of those residuals are normal. If the p-value is less than 0.05, then it means that we can reject the null hypothesis and the distribution is not normal. We can, you know, we can uh, do that accept, accepted that that distribution is not normal. And here, because the p-value is very small, it's pointing to us that those residuals are not behaving uh, as assuming a Gaussian or normal distribution, okay? If we do another plot instead of the, you know, the, the, the residuals only, but the residuals and the fitted values, okay, which are the estimates of what we are estimating the regression line, we get this plot. And this plot we should have, if the assumption is valid, in other words, the residuals are uh, behaving uh, independently in and normal distribution, we should have a line that is close to zero, okay? But here we have a line that just, you know, goes down and then goes up, right? So that means that this uh, behavior, the residuals is not, is not normal, okay? You know, there, there's too many, you know, too many going on in the trend of this, uh, of, of, of this mother. And of course, also it points out that the variance in this case also is not uh, constant, okay? Uh, let me see. Also, also we can have the QQ plot, right? Which is another method that we can test these residuals. And as you can see, if the residuals are behaving in a normal way, a Gaussian way, they should be aligning to this red line. And most of them are. The only problem is that at the end, okay, the end tails, uh, they are kind of deviating from that, you know, from that uh, diagonal uh, line. That means also that the, the, the residuals are not behaving in a normal way. Then we have another one, okay? These are the, the plots that you see in R when you uh, use the plot and then insert the, the LM model 
these are the plots that you know that it, it, it will give you. So the other one is for the uh, the, the variance, okay? The almost scedasticity test, which is you know uniform variance, heteroscedasticity, non-uniform. So in this one, what we're going to see is that also uh, this should be this line should be close to one uh, here, and as you can see, it follows the same way that is behaving in, in here, okay? And you can see that the variance is really at the, you know, when, when the line progresses, the variance is getting larger and larger. In fact, we have an indication that there could be some outliers here. Those points could indicate some outlier uh, values, okay? So definitely this model, I will say in general, this model is not, um, it's not valid because the assumptions that we have in the re linear regression, the normality distribution of the residuals, the almost scedasticity, et cetera, uh, is not happening. Okay. Uh, comments, questions? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. I have a so, question. Yes, go ahead. If, uh, for example, if the model have, have given us still a very wide a good accuracy, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe if it happened like right now, the the right. conditions for for a linear model to work like normality and such, uh, mm -hmm. they don't they don't arise. Uh, right. Does that make us reject the model if it even if it is giving us good predictions or what do we do? Uh, well, we we have we have to do more. You know, uh, we have to we have to work with this model. Okay. So one of the things that we could do because of the behavior of horsepower, okay, and you can see it in, uh, you can see it in a per plot, you know, soon, but you can see that horsepower is not really behaving in a linear fashion, right? Okay, you know, you see these numbers going a little bit up and then uh, go, going kind of flat here, okay? So it's not a perfect linear behavior. So one of the things that you could, uh, do is transform, uh, you can transform MPG also, okay? Uh, depending on how, you know, how it behaves. And right now MPG also is behaving really weird here, right? You know, it's not behaving very uh, Gaussian type, but let's take horsepower. So one of the things that you can do is transform uh, your predictors, okay? So for example, you can apply a log and see what is the effect of that, or you can apply a square root, or you can apply power depending on what is the transformation that you are, you know, you, you are using. But definitely, this model is not, you know, is 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 not conforming with what a linear regression model should be doing. Okay, so in that case, is is a is is it presents doubts in terms of the validity of the of the model. All right. Uh, also, you could use, you know, but this is for, you know, more advanced, you could use also a polynomial, right? Okay, a polynomial to try to see instead of a straight line, maybe a curve could be a best fit. And that could help. All right. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that too, because if you go back, mm -hmm. like, oh, that one, the QQ plot, like, right. um, yeah, because yeah, you kind of see it where, it kind of looks like it's on the line, but because you see there is that curvature that you can see like in right. that plot and then some of the other ones. And yeah, mm -hmm. so Lucio basically, if it doesn't, um, it doesn't fit the assumptions, you just have to reject the model. Like, yeah. Yeah, that, that definitely, this model, uh, I will say that this model needs, needs work. It's, it's our first try, right? So this model needs work and we're seeing that we need to do some transformations, maybe using some polynomials, et cetera, to try to get a better fit, and also try to see if we can conform to those assumptions. Okay? Okay, thanks. Okay, good. Okay, so let's continue with the auto data set. This is 3.9. And here, uh, the first exercise is to do a scatter plot, what is called a scatter plot matrix. So you can do this with the the Seaborn uh, function called per, per plot, all right? And you just input the the data, the data set, and then uh, for 
purposes of uh, of you know do, doing a, a better coloring, I use this palette. Where you see this palette in a, in a second pair plan. So here, what we're, what we're doing is just getting all those numeric uh, features right. We're getting in a table, and every time there's an intersection within each of the same variable, right? For example, MPG. This is the intersection. You get a histogram, right? If it is a you know numeric value, so we get some information in terms of, for example, if we just uh, hone to MPG, you see that you know that curve happening in different predictors. For example, horsepower. You know, it behaves not like a line, but more like a curve. Okay, the trend line. Then displacement also weight. Acceleration is all over the place. Okay. So right now, you know, we don't know exactly, you know, if acceleration is a group predictor or not. Then you see also in year that there is, uh, depending on the year, there's there's going to be a 70, right? 1970, 1980, etc. You see a gradual increase in the MPGs. So newer models are going to have a higher, a higher MPG than uh, older models. And that makes sense, right? Okay, with new technology, you get new new efficiency, the performance. And also in the origin that you see that it behaves very clearly like a categorical because you have this string of points. You don't have it all scattered like in the numeric continuous variables. So it gives you a lot of information here about you know your uh, predictors and how they're behaving when they interact with each other. Okay, so I also, uh, included this pair plot, it's not in the exercise per se, but this one also gives us a little more information. And is that if you add a hue, what is called, which is in ggplot, this could be like a, like a fill, okay? If you do the hue of origin, then the data is going to be split by this, you know, uh, by, by the origin. So for example, we have three labels, right? An origin, number one, American cars, number two, European cars, and number three, um, uh, Japanese cars, okay? So now we can see very clearly that this, you know, uh, density, kernel density uh, plot, which corresponds to the American uh, for the MPG, right? This is the scale for the MPG. You see that most of them are a little bit less in the average MPG than their counterparts of European and Japanese. So the Japanese are the ones in general that have a higher MPG than the American and the European, all right? And also you can see interesting things about you know, how they are you know, behaving in terms of cylinders, right? Because cylinders is behaving like a categorical. So you have this you know, a modes, okay? Within the distribution, all right? And you have also uh, different, uh, you know, sets of behaviors here in terms of the American cars, European cars, and Japanese. So this gives you a little more information about you know, what is going on. So the second one is uh, compute the matrix of correlations between the variables using the data frame dot core method. So we're going to apply auto to dot core, and this is the correlation between each of those variables. Remember, we're only uh, dealing with numeric here variables. In fact, you know, the that core uh, method, uh, it gives you, by default, it gives you the Pearson, uh, you know, correlation index. Uh, you can uh, you can specify which method do you want. If you want Pearson, you want Spearman, or you want Kendall. Spearman and Kendall are variations of the correlation because they, they use ranking, okay? They, they don't use the numerical values. They use the precision of those, uh, of those variables, okay? But this is a little bit, you know, difficult to, uh, to appreciate in terms of how, 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 you know, how different predictors are behaving against other predictors. Is there multicollinearity here? So one of the things that we could do is that we could do a correlation heat map. And this is something that is very, uh, very descriptive. So we're going to use the autocore, right? The autocorrelations. We're going to use the heat map method 
of uh, Seaborn, we're going to specify the scale between minus one and one, okay? We're going to say that annotate is true so we can have the numbers, the index, the correlation index numbers within each of the squares, and then, you know, some uh, palette, okay? Which is brown and, and green. So here now, these are the same numbers here for this uh, correlation heat map. But now we can see very clearly that for example, MPG, right? MPG, there's a high correlation between MPG and cylinders, displacement, horsepower, and weight, right? All these four has uh, the highest correlation with MPG. The problem is that all those uh, variables that I mentioned, they are correlated, highly correlated within themselves. So we have a classic problem of multicollinearity here, okay? And that's something that is going to be reflected when we do a model uh, with all, most of the predictors, modern numerical predictors, you will see that there's going to be, uh, you know, kind of an inflation factor within those, uh, those variables. And that's something that is going to eventually going to give you problems with the model, all right? You see that acceleration, remember that acceleration was all over the place in the, in the pair plot. At uh, acceleration, the, the, the correlation is 0.42. Not that bad, but not that strong. And then year and then R, okay? So th this one really gives give us, you know, a lot of information about, you know, the interaction between the predictors, the response and within the predictors also. Okay, so now the moment of truth truth. We are going to use the OLS, okay, the same function that we did with the horsepower, but now we're going to add this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, predictors, okay? We're going to add more predictors to our model. So one way to do it is with the OLS, capital OLS, okay? And it's going to give you the same information. But I try another method. And the method that I try, which is similar to what we do in R, is the OLS in uh, lowercase, okay? And there you can specify a formula here. You can specify the formula similar to what we do in R, right? We do the response in one side, and then with the wiggly line, we get the predictors, all right? So now we're going to get the predictors, and also we can specify if the variable is going to be numeric or categorical. So for the cylinders and the origin, we're going to put a C there. That means that treat this variable instead of numeric as categorical. In other words, treat it as labels, okay? That gives us a little bit of advantage that we don't, I, I, I couldn't find that advantage here in the in, uh, uppercase OLS. Probably we'll have to do some, you know, uh, type manipulation to get the cylinders and origin as objects and then you know do this uh, fitting. But here with one formula, you can do it all, okay? And of course, you have to specify the data because we're only specifying the name of the, of the variables and then we're going to add the fit, okay? We're going to fit the model and we're going to get something called reg, okay? It could be anything, but we're going to go reg just to make it different from the first model that we had uh, with horsepower, okay? So now when we apply this fit and model, right? The reg, uh, we apply the summary, then we get the table that we are used to, right? You know, with our, the, with the, with the, with the, with the, with our, but also the one that we presented also with the first model, okay? And here, in the predictors, right? In the, you know, adding the predictors, definitely the R square uh, increase, right? From 0.604 to 0.847. But the adjusted R square is the one that we have to, you know, we have to pay more attention. To. And the R square is a little bit lower. It's still in that range, but it's a little bit lower. Okay. And then we have all the coefficients with the cylinders. Remember, the cylinders is a label now. So the basis cylinders equal to three. And then we have, which is zero, and then we have four, five, six, eight, each which is own coefficients. And the same with origin. The base is one, which is zero, and then uh, origin two, origin three, and then the other, uh, 
the other variables, okay? So now, let's see what we can say about this bottle. We talk okay. about the R square. Uh-huh, go, go ahead. Okay, sorry for drawing you back again. Do yeah, I, sure. I was thinking other, I, I did not, I missed the time and that is why I joined late today. Uh, okay. But I want to take you over to the correlation um, metrics you were showing. Here? Though, okay. uh, though I know I'm not uh, very uh, vast in Python, but I know in R we can achieve uh, this same uh, plot. But the one question I want to ask, is there a way we can add the significant asterisk to this uh, matrix in, in Python? Mm, there's a way, okay, but you have to you have to do some coding here, okay. You have to do some coding if you want, let's say, like a p values here. Yes, like yeah, yeah. the correlation between two variables. Maybe if it's significant, you know, in some paper you see they put the asterisk there, maybe at five percent, at one percent. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think I know what we're talking about. Uh, yes, uh, you have to do some coding, okay? Because remember, uh, these models, I mean, stats models works with p-values, but usually, uh, you know, uh, Python, uh, they don't, you know, they don't give you the p-values, you know, uh, uh, out, of the, uh, out of the method, okay? So here, we only have, you know, this correlation method doesn't have the p-values. Uh, you will have to do some coding you know, to calculate each of the p-values of each of the of the, the correlations, all right? Uh, but the, I, I've seen it, okay? I haven't used it because then, you know, I could use R, right? Uh, you know, don't waste that much time there. But uh, yeah, but it is, it's, it's possible, okay? That's what I can, that's what I can say right now. <laughs> okay, By so the now- way, the, the lowercase yeah. OLS function, where did you import it? from the what the lowercase ols ols function? yes it's right it's right here remember when imported the the libraries it's right here oh, okay okay i'm importing from the stats model okay but it's a different model than the ols with uppercase okay this one lets you use the formulas that you're used to in R. Okay. okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, now, let's try to make some sense about you know, what's happening here. Okay, so uh, the model R square is 0.447, which is an, a high, a, a, a higher than the simple linear regression that we saw in 3.8, which is 0.604. Then we have in stats model, in this uh, summary table, also we have the p-values for the coefficients. And what is saying the p-value is that that's the probability of that coefficient associated with that variable, uh, if the probability of, of being zero, okay? So a, a lower probability, that means that that probability is not, you know, is, is, is very improbable, or if it's, uh, higher, let's, that, let's say that higher than 0 0.05, then that coefficient could be zero. zero uh, coefficient zero means that that variable is not you know, significant, okay? And the only one that we see from this model is this one, acceleration, okay? The one that was all over the place, okay? That one has a p-value, right, of 0 0.582, way higher than 0 0.05. And as you can see, also you have the confidence intervals of that estimate. And you see that it goes from negative to positive. In other words, zero is part of that confidence interval. So this acceleration uh, right now is not a significant variable for this model, okay? And of course, there's an issue of strong multicollinearity and you see it in this number right here. Okay, the, it's called the condition number. It says the condition number is large. This may indicate that there are strong multicollinearity or other numerical problems, okay? Now, uh, one of the things that the exercise did was to 
uh, you know, ask us about the relationship between the predictors, the response, et cetera, and do an ANOVA. So an ANOVA is an analysis of, of variance, right? But that's kind of a misnomer because when you see the definition of the ANOVA, the, the hypothesis test is really testing the mean of the groups, okay? So here, when we do the, the stats ANOVA LM, okay, which is the function that the exercise is referring, what we're getting is an F statistic of each of the, of the variables. So that means that if the F statistic is very small, the probability of the statistic is shows very small, that means that there is a significant difference between each of the groups, okay? If you group MPG by each of these variables, okay? As you can see, these are the predictors. There's no response here, the MPG, all right? So if you take cylinders and compare it to origin in terms of MPG, you see that there's going to be a significant difference between those groups, okay? The only one that doesn't pass the test is acceleration, all right? Because it has this figure, which is the same figure as this one, the probability for the uh, coefficient state, okay? So this is a reflection of what's happening here with those p-values. Okay. Good. Okay. That's so now let's see. We have time. Okay. We are 206, so we are past the time. Aha, go ahead, Lily. <laughs> oh, no, I was just answering you. Said we're good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I don't want to, you know, intrude in, in, in anyone's time. So maybe we can stop here. Um, I don't know if you want to continue for the next session. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to be available because I'm going to be in the art conference in Chicago. Okay, the next uh, week. Yeah. Oh, I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll be doing the workshops. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to I don't be... mind. Ah. I was going to just say, I don't mind staying to finish this problem. I don't know how everyone else feels, but if we just want to finish up 3.9. Yeah, yeah I, I, stay I, I, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so let's finish it then. Okay, so which are, uh, the other question is, which predictors appear to have statistically significant relation to the response? So according to the ANOVA and also to the summary table, right, the p-value, the, the, the p uh, I will say that the ANOVA table reaffirms the conclusion that the predictors relationship to the response is statistically significant, except this one, acceleration. That's the, that's the one that really is not, you know, it's not significant because it could be zero. Then, what's the coefficient for the year variable suggests? Okay, so let's look at that. The coefficient here for the year is 0 0.7451. Okay, and we're treating year as a numerical value. So that means that since the year is positive, right? 0 0.07451. That means that an increase in year also means an increase in MPG around 0 0.05 MPG per year. Of course, everything has to remain the same, right? Okay, so if any, everything remains the same, and it's a Latin phrase for that, that we're going to see it later, uh, year is going to, you know, as, as long as the year increases, also the MPG should increase by this factor, 0 0.7451, all right? Then, again, let's produce some diagnostic plots to see if our assumptions are valid. As you saw in the simple linear regression, this model also uh, is not doing very well when we do the residuals versus the fitted plot. You know, that line should be close to zero, and here we have a line that goes down and then goes up. So we still have that situation. Um, because we haven't done any transformations to the predictors, well, you know, that's that's expected, okay? We have the QQ plot also, and this one really uh, deviates at the, you know, the upper end, the upper tails, it really deviates from the, from the, from the red line, okay? Which is the one that is indicating if, if it is a, if it is following a normal Gaussian distribution or not. Okay. And then 
when we go to the standardized residuals for the almost elasticity test, uh, we see that there is some improvement, <laughs> some improvement, but the problem is that the la la line should be a hugging 0 0.75, it should be hugging this, it should be hugging one. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of you know under under the 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 baseline that we should be we should be getting. Okay, and of course because there's a trend, a, a smaller trend on the other one, there is still indication of uh, non-uniform uh, variables. Okay, so what happens? This is the this is the, 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 I think this is the last question, I think. What happens when we only use the predictors that are significant? Okay, so we said that acceleration is not significant, correct? So we're going to take that out of the original model. And we're going to uh, construct another uh, regression model, but without, uh, well, let me see. Let me see, I think I'm, I'm at a, a boo-boo here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Uh, I should have taken the, the acceleration out. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do it. So we're, we're not going to be, be doing that. Okay, but let's say that uh, we, we do some interactions. Let's keep the acceleration. Uh, I, I thought that you know, one of the models that I use was with acceleration, uh, but I, I kept it for some reason. Okay. So let's try an interaction between cylinders and displacement. So we're going to use a model that is going to have all the predictors, but then we're going to add this interaction, which is cylinders as a, a categorical uh, variable, and then multiplied by the displacement and see you know, what is the effect on the model. So with the summary, we see that the R square increase Okay, and also the adjusted square also increase. But when we see the p-values for that interaction of cylinders and displacement, uh, they are higher than uh, 0 0.05. Okay, so that means that that interaction is really not significant. In other words, the coefficient could be zero. That's a high probability that the coefficient could be zero. Okay. And that's what we said here, the interaction between cylinders and display does not appear to be statistically significant because the p-values are more. What about if we do another interaction with weight and displacement? So we're going to construct another model, okay, with all these uh, predictors, but then we're going to add this. Weight uh, multiplied by displacement, and that's the interaction uh, function that we're adding. So now we had the R square 0 0.68, 0 0.868. Now we have an R square of 0.867 with the adjusted square of 0.66. And now our interactions here, weight and displacement, ah, very significant here, okay? The p-value is very small here, okay? Zero, this is the p-value here, okay? So that interaction, really you know is adding to the to the problem still the acceleration is not significant so one of the models that we could do is to see you know taking out this acceleration and do it again to see how it you know if it improves you know this metrics all right so let's see what else okay so we did interaction with uh cylinder displacement that didn't help that much, okay? Then we did with weight and displacement and that was significant, that helped. Now we're going to do a couple of transformations, okay? Try a few different transformation of variables such as log, square root, uh, x to the power of two, et cetera, to see you know, what happens. So I choose to log transform the host power because of the you know behavior that we had and then I try to kind of include, again, the acceleration with the square root. So here is the transformation, right? Log of horsepower and square root of acceleration. We're keeping uh, you know, the original models to try to compare you know, what happens. So here in that summary, we got the same R square that we got when the interaction of weights and displacement, 
the adjusted R square also went a little bit down, I think. Okay, 0 0.66, 0 0.65, okay. But then we look at the effect, right? Of the log of horsepower and the acceleration. And as we can see, the log horsepower is statistically significant. Still the acceleration with the square root is that. Okay, so I believe that acceleration really is not something that we can, you know, we can uh, fix uh, with the transformation. But the log of the horsepower is significant uh, here. So we could see with uh, different plots, we could see what is the effect of the multicollinearity issue that we have, you know, when we put the log, you know, if it alleviates or not. Okay. All right, so that is 3.9. 3.10 uses another uh, data set, which is uh, car seats. Uh, so I don't know if we still have time <laughs> to do that one, okay? But at least, you know, with the auto, we got a pretty good idea of what things, you know, need to be done to try to, you know, uh, validate this model and get those assumptions, the, the residuals and the, uh, various problems that we have in the multicollinearity, try to ameliorate or minimize uh, that uh, non-conformance, okay? I have a question. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming the answer would probably be no, but is there some sort of like doing a stepwise regression with Python or is it you kind of just have to do it all manually? Okay, I've I seen the stepwise and I think that models has served. Uh, has a, has, a, has a method for that. What I've seen in this scikit-learn, and what it does is that they treat it as a feature selection, uh, you know, uh, 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 a problem, okay? So for example, you can do backward, you can do a forward selection, the stepwise, et cetera, but it's more like a feature selection. In other words, if you have 20 variables and you want to model with the most, important let's say 15 most important variables you can you can use that okay yeah okay to try to, 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 to try to get you know the most important variables which is going to be coefficient you know the estimated coefficient you know maybe some p-values there you know in the in the model to try to see you know which are the ones that are most uh most important uh, to the model okay and um, here, but here, I, I don't know if stats model, I, I, I don't remember. I have to check, you know, with the IPI. The stats model has that, uh, I, I think it does, but I haven't used it yet. Okay. Okay. But okay. remember, not necessarily because you have, you know, you have the most important features. When you do a linear regression, you're going to then validate. Uh, you know, your assumption is going to be validated. You still have to do that exercise. And sometimes you have to do some tweaking for your tweaking there. Okay. Okay, so I think that the 3.10, um, I think that you can, you know, just just go through it. Um, and if you have any, you know, any questions or comments, etc., cetera, you know, you can, we can uh, use the Slack for this. Okay, okay, this one, interesting, with the residuals versus fitted, which is the normality of the of the residuals, uh, it kind of, you know, conforms very well. You see that dotted line in zero and the red line, although it kind of tried to get up, but it's still a better fit than the one that we, uh, that we did with the auto, right? Of course, you know, there's some, there's some outliers there, you know, pesking there. And, uh, the the issue here is going to be on the leverage the, on the leverage uh, points you know for the points there's these points uh, 42 uh, observation number 42 that is way out you know in the leverage uh, scale so that means that this point is really if we take this point out of the linear regression uh, the slope is going to change uh, significantly okay so this point has to be uh, has to, has to be research, okay, to see if it's a valid point or not, or try to do some transformation, okay? That's basically, you know, more the the the, the, the story of the car seats data set in a, in a nutshell there. <laughs> hmm. 
Thank you. <laughs> this is really yeah. good. I'm yeah, I'm looking forward to yeah. like looking to the R and Python side by side. This was right, good. right. Thank you. Right. By the way, Ricardo, uh, in your experience uh -huh. working with Python. Mm -hmm. Uh, how how many years functions that we that we need for this type of work? Uh, that there are also R equivalents like the lowercase OLS function. Right, right. Uh, Has that been the case? Or... Okay. Uh, re repeat the question again. You know, I got lost. You know, in the last you know comment. <laughs> ah, if, if, if in your experience working with Python. Uh -huh. If uh -huh. perhaps most of the time uh, you you have found like functions that all, almost translate directly what we use in R, but in Python, kind of similarly like with the lowercase OLS function. Right. Uh, not really. Uh, because you know that the 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 library that you usually use for machine learning in Python is called Scikit-Learn. Okay. And scikit-learn doesn't give you p-values. You know, it's a different uh, philosophy. It's more, you know, they are they are more geared to predictive, you know, pre pre uh, pre predictive power or accuracy of the model. Uh, the stats model, I believe that the philosophy is to, you know, give our users a, a more a smoother transition to Python. Okay, so that's why stats model incorporates certain aspects of R that usually you don't you, know, you don't see in other libraries in Python. Uh, when you use scikit-learn, uh, you know, you are not going to see anything anything like this on p-values, statistical inference, etc. because that's not their philosophy. The philosophy was more create the models for doing uh, predictions uh, efficiently. Okay. Okay. So, so in other words, that yeah, so that's in other words, stats models is like an outlier in the Python Python ecosystem. <laughs> stats model is kind of an outlier because it takes a lot of the philosophy from R, not from you know, not not from the people from from that work in Python. <laughs> yeah, when the Python version of the book was announced, I I was hoping that maybe Scikit was going to be implemented in most of the code, uh, but oh. no. It was oh yeah, well, well, okay. We we're going to use it, okay? Because when you when you go to uh, different models, okay, for example, uh, tree based models, etc., you're going to use scikit learn. You're not going to use that model. The only thing that for regression, you know, for linear regression, logistic regression, etc., stats model is more akin to R, okay? So and because we are in an R, you know, uh, uh, book club basically. Uh, it you know it 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 facilitates that trans transition, but we're going to be using scikit learn. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that that's inescapable in Python. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's uh, it. Let me do the end here.